This interview is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Live. I'm Vanessa Collette at the Toronto Resource Investment Conference. Today I'm joined by Peter Spina, founder of GoldSeek and SilverSeek.com. Welcome Peter, great to have you here with us. Great, it's great to be back, thank you. Peter, what is happening with the gold price right now? Well, over the last months we saw gold correct down to about 1180 and then a reverse and bounce higher to about 1430 an ounce. Uh, in the last week, we've seen that come back down, and in, in the last uh, day or two, we're, we're now approaching $1,300. So from a technical perspective, we're undergoing a consolidation phase. This is uh, pretty normal after a large correction. And we have pretty good support around the $1,300 an ounce mark, but those are a, lot, a lot of that's driven by the technical trader market's not a true reflection of, of the f physical demand in the market right now. Right, right. Well, I guess the more important question would be, where is gold going? Well, the short term is difficult to predict. I think the uh, major items coming up is the Fed meeting next week and the German election. So we'll see what happens there. I believe there's a lot of focus on this tapering question, how much is going to be ta how much tapering there will be. Uh, I guess there will be some in the next this meeting or next meeting, but it'll be more symbolic. It's more of a psychological game at this point. The Fed is, is trapped, it's in a corner right now. They can't really pull back significantly. If they did, there'd be grave consequences and, and uh, they're just simply unable to at this point. So you're saying they might make a symbolic gesture to taper a small amount, but they're not really actually going to be shutting the whole thing down. Right, they're, they're unable to. If they were, you'd see the Treasury market uh, rates uh, spike significantly. Um, that would cause all sorts of issues. Um, they, they are uh, going to be forced to continue buying treasuries. So there, there's, this is more of a psychological game at this point. And once the general populace understands that what's happening, uh, they wake up, that's what will trigger the next run in gold and silver. Interesting. Well, moving over to silver, I know you follow silver quite closely, and you've said that the silver price is not sustainable at these levels. What's keeping it down right now? Well, there's uh, multiple factors we saw, like with gold, quick liquidation. In today's world, uh, traders and investors just hit a key on the keyboard and they liquidate their gold and silver in a very quick manner. And with momentum traders and, and speculators, the price was driven down very quickly. And, and on top of that, we have a very high concentration of short positions uh, in the market, which is uh, creating a price which is well below the equilibrium. And a lot of mining companies are unable to, to make money at the, these prices in gold and silver. We're seeing pullbacks in mine production in gold and silver. And I think the longer this uh, continues to be at these de depressed prices, the more supply, uh, physical gold and silver supply issues we'll see. In January, you were expecting silver to hit around 40 or $50 by the end of this year. You know, double what it is today. Do you still see that happening now? No, the time frame has now been pushed off. Right now we're in the consolidation phase. We'll probably have to wait about another year before that will occur right now. I think by the end of the year we'll see the, the next leg begin. Uh, we'll probably see silver more in the $25, $30 an ounce range and then next year expect $35, $40 plus and, and, and it's, it's, it's going to get back up to 50 but the question of time right now is it's, it's a bit difficult to gauge at this moment. What happened this year in silver that maybe you didn't expect? Well, what I'm surprised is how quickly this market fell on the downside, how quickly people left the market and sentiment got so extremely negative considering where everything is at. The fundamentals, um, you know, and the monetary system and uh, in the gold and silver markets just don't justify the current prices. So I believe that the, the current extreme negativity um, in the gold and silver markets is going to uh, it, it, from a contrarian standpoint, is very bullish, and that's going to lift in the coming months. But I, I was surprised how extremely negative uh, investors and, and, and the whole market got. It was shocking to you. You were surprised. Yes. So, do gold and silver move in tandem? How closely do they move together? Well, silver moves much 
faster to the upside and to the downside. So it's a higher beta gold stock in a way. And so when, uh, you know, right now with uh, gold around $1,300 and silver around 20, you're seeing around a 60 or so ratio. Uh, that's a very, it's, it's a very good price uh, to be more uh, leveraged to silver than gold. Now, India has been, you know, moving quite aggressively to stem gold imports. How is that working? Well, they're uh, in a difficult position uh, between oil and gold. They're creating huge budget deficits, huge uh, current account deficits. So their foreign reserves are being depleted. So with these moves to try to stem that demand, uh, they have been successful in some levels by raising their taxes to 10 percent, import taxes 10 percent, and so on. But the smuggling is increasing significantly, from especially through uh, Dubai. And you can see that demand, those demand figures coming through Dubai, which shows a true demand. They won't be successful in stopping the demand there. It, it's, it's, it's cultural, it's, it's overwhelming, and, and uh, it, it won't be stopped. So you're saying that they're not going to be able to stop the gold purchasing. How is all this going to affect the gold price? Well, we're seeing inventories being depleted. So the longer these prices are, are at these low levels, the faster these inventories of uh, gold supplies will be uh, depleted. So, uh, you know, the, this, uh, this demand is overwhelming. But if you look at the Indian gold price with the drop in the rupee value, we're at actually record gold prices in terms of rupees. So you got to always look at the local currency, the gold price. So gold may be down in U.S. dollar terms, and that's a reflection of the U.S. dollar strength. But gold prices are actually hitting record values in some parts of the world. India is one of them. Interesting. And the recent fall in the rupee, is this related to what's been going on with the gold import uh, restrictions? Right, yeah. I think that and also the government is looking to devalue their currency, just kind of like in Japan. They're trying to take that approach. Um, encourage foreign capital investments and in, in foreign capital reserves, which are desperate for. Well, the U.S. isn't the only country out there printing money, and you've talked a lot about competitive devaluations in the world today. How is that affecting world markets? Well, it's very destabilizing because no one really knows what's going to happen next. There's a lot of guessing going on. No one really knows what the central bank is going to do, say, in the United States. Are they going to taper? How much are they going to taper? Are they going to be printing more? How much more will they be printing in the future? So there, there's a lot of people in the free market are saying, well, you know, what, what are these guys going to do? You know, and, and that's just a reflection of what this system is set up as. It's not a free market. It's, it's controlled by these very uh, exclusive groups around the world. So. They're destabilizing the system. No one really knows what the true uh, equilibrium prices for, for things are. And, and with that uncertainty, that th those are the things that will drive gold and silver. But really, in the end, it's going to be the destruction of trust in the central banks and the recognition that this plan is not going to be successful that will flood uh, investment money back and in, in, in people into the gold and silver markets. Now, are Chinese buyers still buying as much? Oh, yes. They're, very, they're buying at, at incredible levels. And I believe between China and India, those two, uh, those two demand sources equal almost the entire mining supply of the gold market at the moment. Th these are incredible amounts of gold. They've purchased over 1,000 tons of gold in the first several months of this year in uh, China. Uh, they will be coming out next year with their five-year plan with their updated figures and I expect their gold reserves to jump significantly. It, it wouldn't be surprising. It's, it's upwards of 5,000, maybe more thousand tons of gold. Interesting. And so we touched on, you know, U.S. quantitative easing a little bit at the beginning and the upcoming meeting next week. I'm just wondering, you know, the numbers that we're seeing out there on inflation, apparently inflation hasn't happened. You know. Do you think the numbers that are being put out there are accurate? Well, no. It, it just go to the grocery store, see what the prices there are. Look at the things, look at the gas price, look at these things. But also, I think a reflection of inflation is the stock market and the real estate market. Those are the conduits that which the central bank is using to flood the system with money. So those are a reflection of this cheap monetary policy and, and inflation. So. I think inflation is significantly higher, and these official government statistics are just another part of the psychological game to get people to believe that things are under control and not as um, bad as, as they are. So what do you see as a greater risk right now? Is in inflation or deflation? 
Well, it depends what the central bank does, and they're more fearful of deflation. So in the end, they will continue to drive the, the inflationary machine. So the deflationary forces will cause them to create the reaction, which will be uh, printing money, which is inflationary. Interesting. I'd like to go over to the mining companies. You know, we're here at the Resource Investment Conference. There's a lot of mining companies here. Have you gone on any interesting site visits recently or, you know, yeah. any, uh, any recent... Uh... Yeah, I, I'm going on a couple more site visits in the near future, but in the last couple of weeks I was up in British Columbia at the Seabridge KSM project, which is one of the largest undeveloped gold and uh, uh, copper projects in the world. Um, Seabridge Gold is advancing this project currently uh, um, drilling out some very interesting zones at the project. Uh, the project is adjacent to Predium's project, which is also quite in the news, but uh, the, these are excellent assets. Seabridge Gold is uh, trading um, about one ounce of gold per share. And I think, uh, you know, leverage-wise and reserves uh, per, uh, per share-wise, they're, they're one of the most attractive uh, ones out there. So it, it's it's an, a very interesting project in the next, uh, uh, well, well, we'll we'll have some more updates in the near future on, on the current drilling and resource update. But this is an incredible project that will, once in production, will provide over 50 years of production. Uh, so it, it's a company I'm invested in. It's also a company that is a sponsor on the site for, for full disclosure. Are you also following Predium? Yes, um, Predium is. Uh, I, I was more uh, interested when they first were IPOing, and it, it, it's a it's, it's a great asset, but. Um, I, th I believe that Seabridge Gold has got more upside now. Uh, Predium has a higher grade, but not as much tonnage, uh, whereas Seabridge, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot larger asset. So just to wrap up, anything new happening with Goldseek and Silversea? Yes, well, we're uh, in the process of, of launching a new series of live events on this site. So we uh, will be connecting our audience to our authors and companies in a more real-time manner. So I would encourage uh, visitors to participate with that. And what are the live events? Is that like a webinar? Correct, yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's a webinar setup. Uh, so readers can join that, send questions to uh, various analysts and companies to get them answered and, and connect with them in a real-time basis. And you have some online conferences as well, similar live event right. you can watch from home. Yeah, we hold virtual conferences, which is another great way for investors to connect with uh, various analysts and companies. Great. Well, it was a pleasure having you here this morning, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much.